Good morning, my name is Jack Holt, the Minister. Our worship begins with a recognition that when we worship, it is in the presence of the risen Christ. And so, as I light our candle that indicates to us that we are in the presence of the risen Christ, I offer you this greeting. The Lord be with you. Around the world this day, the Universal Church celebrates the reign of Christ. Christ Jesus, friend of the poor, the meek and the merciful, has been enthroned above all authority and power in this world and in the world that is to come. And so make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. God has placed everything under Christ's wounded feet, appointed the one who wore a crown of thorns as the supreme head of the church's body. And so enter his gates with thanksgiving, come into his courts with praise, give thanks and praise his loving name. We sang it last week, but this week it is the appointed psalm Psalm 100, all people that on earth do dwell, to the tune that I have composed. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Him serve with mirth, his praise foretell. Let us pray. God who lets us be, the Abba, the Father of Jesus Christ, for your shepherd heart that remembers us, has cared for us in our folly, has attended to us in our brokenness, receive our homage. Lord Jesus Christ, icon of the living God, for your compassionate nature and sacrificially loving us to death, receive our devotion. Breath of God, source of unity in deity and humanity, for sighing out our groans as prayer and inhaling for us the life of eternity, receive our reverence. Holy Trinity, God for us, with us and within us, for all that you are and all that you have done, for all that we are and all that we shall be, receive the worship of our hearts. God of grace, we have not always lived as your people. Our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. In silence we confess the reality for us behind these words.
People of Polworth and beyond, accept these words. Your sins are forgiven. Hear the gracious declaration of Jesus Christ our Lord. Go and sin no more. Hear again his call to you this day. Come and follow me. Sovereign God, who decreed that thorns would give way to crown, root from our hearts every idol we have falsely enthroned, and give us grace to so bow the knee, that everyone will know by our lives that Christ is King, and speak the day when the whole earth will be his kingdom, ruled by his love who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from the Old Testament and is contained in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a priest who was transported to Babylon at the start of the exile. There he was granted to see a manifestation of God and called to be a prophet to those in captivity. In today's passage, the prophet is the mouthpiece of God, passing judgment on those who had been tasked to rule over the nation and had failed. He uses the imagery most associated with the marks of a good sovereignty, that of a shepherd. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the watercourses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I I will feed them with good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost. And I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide, I will save my flock and they shall no longer be ravaged and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. As pants the heart for cooling streams in parched and by Fresh and grey. 
The second reading is from the New Testament and is contained in the Gospel according to Matthew. The last of the concluding parables to the portion of the story that has described Jesus' earthly ministry is called the parable of the sheep and the goats. In the time of Jesus, before the idea of a worldwide mission was thought possible, the question asked was, how shall the nations of the world be judged by God? The words of Jesus gave the answer. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, and gave you food, or thirsty, and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger, and welcomed you, or naked, and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick, or in prison, and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me naked, and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these. You did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Well, good morning. In 1505, a young man aged 21 was coming home from a journey and there was a thunderstorm. And as the thunder roared, the lightning flashed and then he became terrified that he would be struck by lightning and die. And that thought led to a prayer to the patron saint of miners, which was his father's occupation 
Saint Anne, if you save me, I will become a monk. That young man was Martin Luther and he did survive and he became a monk. And two years later, he was training now to be a priest and so was making his first mass. And as he stood before these elements on the altar, once again terror struck his heart. Who was he to handle these holy things? And who was he to try and make present the God that he feared with all his heart? Martin Luther was someone deeply troubled by an image, and that image was the last judgment. These pictures from the parable that we heard today had been made into wood carvings, into books that allowed them to feast their eyes on the horrors of that last judgment. Christ seen holding a lily, symbol of resurrection, on the right hand where the righteous stood, and with the sword, a terrible swift sword of judgment, in his left hand where the, those condemned to hell, to the eternal fires, were being driven. That Martin Luther couldn't be sure where he stood, that he might be condemned, was the greatest fear of his life. It haunted him. And he had a spiritual director in the monastery who knew that this young man's troubles need not be so. He just had to find something out, a truth that seemed to be evading him. And that truth was the true character and nature of the one who would be judge. Donald Trump's presidency is coming to an end and its lasting legacy will be that he was president and appointed three judges to the Supreme Court. All of these judges' appointments have to be cleared through Senate hearings and approved. And these hearings are to look not just at the ability of the person to be a lawyer, but also the manner in which they would serve the law. Each of these appointments have been called conservative right leading appointments. They are expected to administer the law in a particular way and that's what these hearings set out to prove the character of the judge. We need to look at our Old Testament reading to gain the character of the judge. In ancient times, the judge was also the king. Those who looked for judgment, those who had sentences pronounced upon them, these were done by the king. And so the role was both king and judge. But what was the character to be? And in the reading we discover that from God's perspective, if you are a judge, if you are a king, then you are meant to be a shepherd. You are meant to be someone who looked upon the people as your flock. You are meant to keep your eye on the weak and the strong. You were to ensure that the strong did not in any way inhibit the weak from getting their due. You were to watch out for the strays, the sick. You were to enable the weak to be fed and watered. These were the kind of characteristics that was expected, but yet, as the passage indicates, God found that none of these qualities were now being exhibited by the kings, by the, the judges. And so God makes a declaration that he will now take over again. 
The, the role of king and judge will rest with himself. And then, towards the end of the reading, we hear that whilst he is going to administer this role himself, it will still be through uh, another person. There will be a prince. There will be one appointed who will be that true shepherd of the people. David is the name used. David belongs to the past. Hundreds and years have gone since David's birth. But David was a shepherd before he was a king. And as a king, he sought to continue to be a shepherd. And so in the eyes of God, all who have the right to be called kings and shepherds of the people will be like his servant David. And so it's no accident that scripture tells us that the one who would hold that post was born in the city of David, in Bethlehem. And it's no accident that at his birth, those who were called to see it and recognise the one who lay before them in a manger were shepherds. They were recognising one of their own. And it's no accident that in the ministry of Jesus, what we see is a person carrying out the duties and the characteristics of a good shepherd. So much so that this is one of the main ways in which John's Gospel refers to him. A whole chapter dedicated to the good shepherd. And so, when we think of this scene in Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus is first described as the Son of Man, that describes him in his humanity and humility, he's then declared to be a king. He is the king who sits upon the throne and, like a shepherd, separates the sheep from the goats. But he does so as a shepherd, as a good shepherd. And that's where we have to pause and recognise something about this parable that is often overlooked. Because it speaks of the last things, because in the time of Martin Luther, it was what stood before people in their lives as what would happen at the end. It has taken on that sort of role. And yet, if we look at the gospel, it's not at the end. It's at the end of the portion that describes the ministry of Jesus. But it's not at the end of the story. What happens next in the gospels is the passion the suffering of Jesus. The story of the parable of the sheep and the goats is about a king who has yet to be truly revealed. And when he is truly revealed, it's through his passion. On the cross, he is suffering. On his way to the cross and on the and in the hours of him hanging from that cross, he is someone who experiences all that the parable indicates. When I was hungry, and when I was thirsty, and when I was naked, and when I had no shelter, and when I was in prison. Here is the shepherd experiencing the suffering of the sheep. Here is the shepherd taking on the judgment of God for the sheep. And so this is what Martin Luther eventually discovers. His spiritual director made him a teacher, a teacher of the Bible. He spent months lecturing on the Psalms. 
And when he got to Psalm 22, he saw these words before him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he realised that these were words spoken by Christ before his death on the cross. And he realised that Jesus was experiencing the fear that he himself feared that judgment would separate him from God. His Saviour, Jesus Christ, had felt it, experienced it for him. It opened up the gates to a new way of seeing these scriptures where his great doctrine of being justified by faith through grace was expounded. And it changed forever. No longer his fear of the last judgment, but his welcome of it, because he realised that because his Christ had passed through the suffering for, on behalf of the flock, the flock had no judgment to face. In that picture, we are the least of the brethren that Jesus has gathered around him already. And those that stand before him are all the rest of humanity. And when it comes to them, the parable asks, how will they be judged? And Jesus, the shepherd king, gives a simple answer. I will judge them as myself. I will look at them and say, are they shepherds? And they will show that they are shepherds because they have done what shepherds are called to do. They will have looked after the weak. They will have sought out the lost. They will have cared for the vulnerable. And that's why when they say to him, but Lord, when did you, when did we do these things for you? They will not have recognised that they did it for Christ. They will only have been doing what is in their heart, their shepherd heart. The parable stands where it is to remind all of us that this is the life God has called us to. Those around us as his own, those in the world who have understood the truth, who have recognised it, that we are all called to be shepherds of one another, to look after one another, the weak especially. And so on this last Sunday of the year, we the church celebrate that the end of all things is not something to be feared but to be welcomed because of who's on that throne, who is the king, who is the judge. It is Jesus Christ. He is the good shepherd of us all. And for that, we have only cause to be thankful to God. Amen. Lord, I was a pile of ash, and you made me a light for the world. I was a stone, and you made me salt for the earth. I was as lifeless as clay, and you made me part of the body of Christ. I was sinful, and you made me holy. I was nothing, and you made me part of everything. Lord, in you I am transformed and transformed still again. When the discouraged cry for hope, make me hope. When the hungry cry for bread, make me bread. When the thirsty cry for water, make me water. When the suffering cry for help, make me help. When the sick cry for healing, make me healing. When the bound cry for freedom, make me freedom. When the outcasts cry for love, 
make me love. Lord, who is hope, who is bread and water, who is help and healing, who is freedom, who is love, transform me anew, and so keep me close to you as you transform the world. Amen. We sing the hymn, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds, to the tune that I compose. Sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes our sorrows, heals our wounds, and drives away our fears. It makes the wounded spirit whole and calms the troubled breast. Tis manna to the hungry soul and to the Prayers for others this week have again been written by Astrid Telfer, one of our elders and one of the people who cannot attend our services in person, continuing to have to shield. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we pray for our world. As all nations struggle to bring this pandemic under control and to keep their people safe, may the world's political leaders and decision makers lead with wisdom and by example. We pray for those who are ill, have suffered injuries or are awaiting hospital treatment and we think especially of Anne MacDonald, one of our own elders, who was admitted to hospital after a fall. Those who cannot visit loved ones in their own home, care homes or hospitals. Those who, because of age, infirmity or fear of the virus, have had their social contacts severely restricted. Those who do not have access to technology and find keeping in touch with friends and family difficult. Those who have had their holidays, special events and religious festivals postponed, curtailed or cancelled. Those who are working behind the scenes, testing samples, confirming results and tracing contacts to limit the spread of the virus. and those who are now subject to more severe restrictions than we are. We ask you to bless those working in our health and social care settings, educational and research establishments, local authorities, postal and delivery services, registrar offices, transport networks, funeral directors, prisons, armed forces, shops, hospitality settings and charitable organisations, all of whom are endeavouring to offer the best service they can 
through these difficult times. We take a moment to remember all that is good in life and celebrate those who are demonstrating love and compassion in many small, unex unexceptional but important ways. Saying good morning to a passerby who might speak to no one else that day. Being a good neighbour and helping without being asked. Donating foods for those struggling on low econ incomes. Delivering food and other essentials to the frail and housebound. Being patient in supermarket queues and with staff working in restricted circumstances. Volunteering to test the potential new vaccines which bring us all hope for the future. May this crisis continue to bring out the best in us and not the worst. When this pandemic is a distant memory, may we continue to offer help and support to those who are less fortunate than ourselves while asking for no reward other than knowing that we do so in your name. And here as, as we continue to pray in the words that Jesus taught us, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We conclude singing the paraphrase of the 23rd Psalm, the King of Love, my shepherd is, to the hymn tune, St. Columba, Erin. The King of Love, my shepherd is, whose goodness me And so through all 
shepherd may I sing thy praise within thy house forever. Our worship has ended. Depart in peace. Lord God, we ask for your blessing so that as we go back into our daily living, We remain committed to you in faith, sustained by hope, and enabled to live in love. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you to know his peace. And all the people replied, Amen. Once again, our thanks to everyone who has taken the time to join us and to be part of our worship and community on this Sunday. My thanks again to Astrid for kindly uh, composing the prayers we have used today. Next week, as I've said, is the first Sunday in Advent and those that use the online service will see a different um, visual image as I have taken some of the photographs from my previous parish in Burst and Fugueside where we often got good winters and to give that seasonal look to the services. Unfortunately one of the things that we do in church that you cannot do online is the lighting of our advent wreath but I would invite you in home to perhaps have a candle uh, nearby you that you might light Uh, as part of the weeks of Advent that lie ahead. I'm delighted to say that whilst our usual services for Christmas cannot go ahead this year, there is a team working to ensure that our Polworth Church Christmas shall be celebrated both outside our church and also online. And you'll get more information on that as we draw nearer to Christmas. But as ever, with uh, these restrictions and uh, getting more restrictive for some, less restrictive for others, the main intention behind it all is to reduce this virus and so may we all act responsibly and keep safe. <laughs>